Uh, over the next month, we're going to kind of be going back to fundamentals. What is church? What is the purpose of the church? Who is the church on Maine? What do we do here? And why do we do it? And so we're going to be canvassing those topics over the next month uh, through God's word together. If you notice that when you sat down this morning, there were notes in the seats. And if you didn't get a copy of the notes, we tried to put several on each row. And if you didn't get a copy of the notes, just uh, look behind you and say, hey, is there an extra copy somewhere? And hopefully there was enough for everybody to, to get a copy of the notes. I won't be preaching today as much as I'll be kind of in a, in a teaching mode today. And I want to go over some just fundamental aspects of the church. And you say, well, why would you do that on Father's Day? Well, what do fathers do? Fathers lead. <laughs> fathers teach. And I feel like we're in a beautiful season of teaching opportunity. And I feel like we need to lead and we need to come back to fundamentals. And I even noticed that professional football coaches and baseball coaches and soccer coaches and even the professionals have to come back in and get back down to the fundamentals. So they quit fumbling. So they quit striking out. So that they quit uh, doing things that aren't conducive to their professional nature of the sport that they play and we don't play a sport we're we're doing something of much higher value in football you may win a super bowl in basketball you may win a world championship in baseball you may win the world series in hockey you win the stanley cup but folks we got a much higher prize we're dealing with eternal issues we're not dealing with a trophy we're not dealing with notoriety. We're dealing with eternity. Souls lay in the balance if we are being the church or if we're not being the church. And we want to be the church. I want to talk to you before we go into the scripture this morning. And if you want to be turning to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that's going to be our, our opening scripture. And I had not turned to it in my Bible yet, so I'm turning to it too. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, and I have all the other scriptures typed out for you this morning. So we'll read uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 9 in just a few moments. Wednesday night, we have a wonderful opportunity to support our student ministry at the Church on Main, and Brother Mark's going to tell you more about this um, as he comes up and closes out the service today. But today at the counter in the cafe where you get your donuts and coffee and also in TCOM Central, which is our welcome center at the counter over there, Aaron and Lacey uh, Kennan are going to be over here and Mr. William and Miss Evie Wiley is going to be over here and they're going to have tickets for sale for a baked potato bar Wednesday night. Now on those tickets it says they're $10 and so if you'd like to make a $10 donation, make a $10 donation. Um, if you would, please, we would ask to please have correct change because we don't have change this morning. And if you need to write a check, just make the check out for, um, if you want to buy like 20 tickets, just go ahead and make the check out for that <laughs> amount of money and uh, put the church on main on it. But 100% of the funds, the food is being donated. So 100% of the funds will be going to the youth trip. And the cool thing is sponsorships from inside the church and outside the church have completely paid all registration costs, all hotel costs, all travel costs. And so to those in the church that did sponsorships of the full amount or a partial amount, thank you, thank you, thank you. And for those from outside the church, which there was a good number of them, um, uh, sowed and made investments into our students' lives. But the money that we're going to raise now is for what we're going to be doing in the free time. And so there's different things, of course, to do around Atlanta. So we want to just do the best we can do to, to the kids to have a great time in Christ and a fun time in fellowship. And so without it costing them anything. And here's the great thing about it. Enough money has been raised for the trip that every time we stop, every time we eat, even the meals are paid for. Can you say hallelujah to that? Hallelujah. So I just thank God for that. And our kids are going to be working and serving uh, Wednesday evening. Um, so all of them will be here uh, with you. In serving you so please take your opportunity to get some tickets before you leave today on those tickets it's going to say pickup time 5 30 to 6 30 the pickup time from 5 30 to 6 30 is for anybody that would like to just get it to go you'll come in get your potato fix your potato get your drink get your dessert and you can take it and eat it wherever you want to 
What we're going to do for our service on Wednesday night is we're going to have a total fellowship time together from 6.30 to whenever it ends. And we're going to have a, a good time of fellowship and eating together. And then you can turn your tickets in there. You can buy tickets there. We'd love for you to go ahead and buy a ticket. That way we know how many to prepare for. And then also, we're just going to have a great time for that hour, hour and a half, fellowshipping with one another. we got some neat games that we're going to be playing and some different things that we're going to be uh, doing with you too um, so that we go from there. For sake of time, let's jump straight into the, the notes this morning because there is a lot of ground to cover. Um, I, I don't think I recorded the right scripture for my, for my opening text because it wasn't when I was reading it. I'm like, no, that ain't it. And um, so, boy, you know what? Preachers make mistakes. I not know if you knew that or not, but we do. All of us do. But um, the purpose of the church. And you say, well, Brian, isn't this kind of uh, a, a little bit... Uh, maybe beneath the teaching that we need. You know, we all maybe have grown up in church or at least been familiar with the church. We, we've been pretty much in the Bible Belt. We are kind of the buckle of the Bible Belt down here in, in South Mississippi. Uh, the last count that I heard, I hadn't had an updated count in years, but the last count that I heard when I was uh, in a denominational church is between our neighboring counties, between all the counties that the Tri-County Association ministered to, there was 132 Southern Baptist churches in the three-county area. And that don't mean all the other kind of churches is in those three-county areas. I imagine you could multiply that by about three. So if you just work off of that logic, you got 300 churches in three counties, Marion County being the biggest of those counties and the most populated of those counties. So probably 150 of those churches are right here in Marion County. Somebody would say, well, the last thing we need is another church. But if all the people in Marion County started coming to Jesus Christ, do you realize we don't have enough local bodies of believers to hold them? Because demographically speaking, only about 13 to, to up to maximum of 20% of the population of Marion County, which is about 30,000 citizens, are the only ones that's in church every Sunday morning or on any combination of Sundays and Wednesdays. So that leaves basically 80 to 75 to 80% of people in our county that are not associated or going as members or attending or following Christ in a local body of believers. Folks, we got a lot of work to do. What I'm trying to say is we need to understand the purpose of the church so that we can be the church that Jesus Christ died and raised again and promised to return to get. Because when we all get to heaven, it's not going to just be about what do we do individually. It's also going to be about what we do collectively as a common body of unified believers in Jesus Christ. So, Again, happy Father's Day. Good daddy's lead, so that's what we're going to do. I have been a, 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 a blessed to have a great daddy, and I pray that that's been your uh, life. And if it hadn't been your life, I want to be the first one to say I'm sorry, but I can tell you what, don't judge God by a bad daddy on earth because he's the good, good father. He's the perfect father, and you can take uh, excuses and make them all your life long that you wasn't blessed with a good daddy. But the Bible says he is a father to the fatherless. So you don't have a good daddy, you got a great daddy. So quit looking at what you didn't get and look at who got you, and his name is Jesus Christ. And that'll wholly, radically change everything you do. So today, let's take time to review some fundamentals. Number one, we're going to start first things first, right? What is the church? And here's a really good definition for the church. It's super simple, like I like to keep it. The church is a family of redeemed, means washed in the blood, followers of Jesus Christ. The church is individual, starts with me. It's local, that's this gathering this morning. It's global, that goes from Mississippi through the United States to Africa to Rwanda to Europe to Russia to China, all around the globe, and universal. Now, Brian, why would you say universal? Because Hebrews 12 said there's a great cloud of witnesses in heaven, and guess what they are still considered to be? The church. The church is from me to thee, <laughs> if you want to look at it like that. It is a collective, unified, harmonized body of redeemed believers that start with an individual soul, and it goes to the souls that are collected in heaven, waiting for the rapture of the church, where their bodies and our bodies will be rejoined with our souls, and we're perfected forever in eternity, serving as co-heirs, ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. That's the church. 
Now, there's people out there that want to say, well, what's the body of Christ and what's the bride of Christ? I don't get into all of those things. For me, biblically speaking, the body of Christ is the local by local church. And it's starting with the individual going all through the universe. Whoever considers themselves a believer, a follower, has been redeemed in Jesus Christ. That's the body of Christ. Now, when Christ comes again, he's receiving what? His bride. So that body is being prepared by the Holy Spirit as the bride of Christ for all of eternity. Where are we going? The first thing we're going to go through is we're going to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Guess what? Boy, there's a seat for you if you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You have already made a reservation at the reception of the wedding of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm glad I got a seat reserved there. And I couldn't do anything to pay for it. I couldn't do anything to earn it. It was given to me because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way I can be considered the church. What is the purpose of the church? Now listen to this. I believe this is a beautiful, beautiful example of the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to reflect for all creation the nature of the triune God himself, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Namely, the love between the Father and the Son, which is the Holy Spirit. In short, the church is the eschatological covenant community of love. And eschatology, eschatology is the study of things to come. So the church is the perpetuating community of the love of Jesus Christ. The church as we know it started on Pentecost when Peter stood and preached upon that balcony. And the people heard the message in their own native language and they started saying, what shall then we do? And Peter said, repent, be baptized and follow the way of the Lord. And it says about 3,000 would added to them that day. Now, my goodness, I don't know what the sermon was that day, but you know what? I bet it was super simple. I bet it was all about the things that Peter had seen, that he had beheld in Jesus Christ. I bet you Peter, the apostle, the disciple, got up there and he told his story as he had walked with Jesus for the last three years. I bet that's all he did. Because Peter had never been to seminary. Peter had never studied hermeneutics. Peter had never, he didn't have the, the closed Bible that we have, Genesis to Revelation, to go and to preach from and to wrestle with the scriptures. All he had was to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit and to tell what he had seen. He was what the Bible said that we should be witnesses unto Christ. If you're wondering why you need to preach and you're a preacher, you are a preacher. You need to be preaching your story. You need to be preaching your testimony, your history with Jesus Christ. And that's the gospel that people need to hear. How did God change my life? And you don't wait on preachers to get on platforms to preach. God spoke to me a long time ago. He said, Brian, if you're waiting on a pulpit to preach, you'll never make it. You'll always be waiting. You got to start preaching the sermon now before the pulpit comes. And I took him at his word and I just started telling people what God had done in my life. You don't have to be good about with it. You don't have to have the right words to say. You don't have to worry about eloquence because matter of fact, on all the disciples in the New Testament, this is what the Bible says about them. They could tell they were uneducated, unlearned men, but they took note of one fact. They had been with the Lord. It doesn't matter what your level of education is. It matters about your intimacy in the presence of the Lord. Have you been with him? That's what will show forth. And that's what will birth the fruit in your ministry and in your life. What is the chief mandate of the church? And we're going to get a little more, a little more bringing in a little bit right here, okay, for the rest of the service. What is the chief mandate of the church? The chief mandate of the church is to glorify God. What does it mean to glorify? To acknowledge and reveal the majesty and splendor of God by one's actions. Let's see, I read that and it said, acknowledge and reveal the majesty and splendor of God by one's words. It's not what the definition says. There's a lot of people that can talk to talk. But there's not a lot of, not a lot of people whose talk and walk are matching up. So we need to understand to glorify God means not only we acknowledge and reveal his majesty and his splendor, but we do it by the life that we lead. 
And that's super important because when you begin to see what worship really means, it is expanded into a lifestyle. It is not an event that happens in church in a certain time slot in a certain way. Worship is so much larger than that. Worship is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year from the time I met Jesus Christ and the, to the time I see him again and then my worship won't end my, my worship then will be exalted and glorified and I'll be in eternity worshiping him there are going to be some people upset when we get into eternity and, and, and we don't worship like they want to worship in heaven there are going to be some folks that last church I was in we didn't worship like this folks you can't move your membership when you get to heaven there is not but one heaven. I got a feeling I'm just being a little bit funny because when we all get to heaven, you know what? Here's the great thing. I'm not going to be like me anymore. I'm going to be like him. I'm not going to be broken anymore. I'm going to be perfectly whole. I'm not going to have the thoughts that I have here on the face of the earth anymore. And I'm not going to get caught up in personal preferences anymore. When I see him, I am going to be like he is. But you know what? I don't want to wait on that time frame to start experiencing some of this promised land living. I want some of the promised land living. I want some of the promised land praying. I want some of the promised land preaching. I want some of the promised land singing. I want some of the promised land miracles. I want some of the promised land language. I want some of the promised land resurrection. I want some of the promised land healing. I want to be living some of the promised land right here in an alien and a stranger in this land. What are we waiting for? We are the church. We are redeemed. And the gates of hell will not prosper or prevail against us. So let's just don't wait till then. Let's unify, let's harmonize, let's be the church. Let's through the Holy Spirit fulfill our purpose and our mandate to glorify God. And when we're together in that and dancing with our Father God in the fields of grace, we'll be sowing seeds of the gospel and the Lord can trust us with souls to come into this place that we won't leave them as babes in Christ, but we will get them grown up and mature so that they can go forth and do the same thing and reproduce themselves spiritually the purpose and the mandate of the church how does the church achieve the mandate to glorify God first and foremost the way the church achieves the mandate to glorify God is through worship the definition that we're working with for worship and there's a lot of people that define worship in a lot of different ways but here we're going to define it very simply attributing worth to one who is worthy is God worthy God sent his only son which means he wrapped himself in our sinful flesh to become Emmanuel God with us Jesus Christ to be born of a virgin in Bethlehem to live sinlessly to die mine and your guilty sin death our sin was placed upon him and then to raise three days later from that garden tomb and then to ascend back into the arms of the Father 40 days after that off of the Mount of Olives with a promise to the disciples that were standing there looking through the angels you men of Galilee why do you stand here gazing go tear yourselves around Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high that power from on high came that Pentecost morning which means 50 days after Passover no church no denomination has the rights to say this is what Pentecost is Pentecost is simply a celebration on the Jewish calendar a festival that takes place 50 days after Passover and I am not going to wait till 50 days after Passover to celebrate Passover. I'm celebrating Passover every day of my life. That's what worship is. If you don't remember where Passover came from, think back to the 10 plagues on number 10 of the 10 plagues over in Egypt when Pharaoh would not let Israel escape and go. It, uh, the 10th plague was the death of everyone's firstborn son. But they took, the Israelites took the blood of the lamb as they were instructed and they placed the blood of the lamb upon the doorpost of their homes. And when the death angel passed through Egypt, when he noticed the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of that home, he did not take the life 
of that firstborn son. He passed over that home. He passed over that family. Guess what? The blood of the lamb has not been put on the doorpost of my house, but the blood of the lamb has been put on the doorpost of my heart and your heart. You have been washed in the blood. You've not just been marked by the blood. We've been washed in the blood. And there is no angel in heaven, under hell, anywhere else in between. They must pass over us because we are marked as the children of God. So that's why we celebrate Passover, not once a year, but every day of every year. And let that be the very foundation of your worship and your glorification of God. Because can't nobody touch us. We're marked by the blood of the Lamb. You say, well, why isn't everything perfect, Brian? Well, was everything perfect for Israel? They, They didn't know it yet, but they had 40 years of wilderness wanderings ahead of them. Because guess what? We imperfect people start to make decisions even though God moved in a perfect way upon our lives. And we have such a way as Adam and Eve did, as David and Bathsheba did, as Brian and Mitzi do, of taking God's perfection and marring it because of my way of thinking and walking in imperfection. But aren't you glad God has this thing called grace? Aren't you glad God is full of loving kindnesses? Aren't you glad God is patient and shows us that patience? I don't know where you're at in your wilderness wanderings. I don't know if you took the, the, the attitude of two of the spies or eight of the spies. I don't know if you walked in this morning saying God is able or nope, the giants in the land are too big. I don't know about any of those things, but I can tell you this. If you'll follow God, you're gonna make it to the promised land. You're going to make it to the promised land just to begin to worship him. We worship him. We glorify him. What does worshiping him mean? We worship him to the point that his worthiness becomes the norm and the inspiration of human living, individually and in community. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It tells us to not give up meeting together. Some versions say, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Can we agree on something, church? I agree that the day is approaching. I mean, you would kind of have to be walking with eyes closed and, and living under a rock. If you can't notice that the birth pains are getting closer together. This ain't no Braxton Hicks, baby. These are real contractions. There's wars and rumors of wars, right? The contractions are close. And when the contractions get close, that means the baby is close. And they're getting closer and closer and closer together. So that means the coming of Jesus Christ is getting closer and closer to us. So I'm just reminding you, it is not the season to be planning things on Sundays and Wednesdays. It is time to be planning other things around the main things that we do on Sundays and Wednesdays. I don't get up and decide if I'm going to come to church. And we'll say, you're the pastor of the church. You're paid to come come if they would pay me I'd come folks I'm gonna be here if I was paid or not if I was pastor or not matter of fact I wasn't pastor for a good portion of my life and I was there because I made a decision that I wanted to be there and not forsake the assembling of myself together and I planned my schedule about what Sunday morning and Wednesday evenings were going to be like for me Now, you may be in a place and listening online and you have worship on Saturday. Great. Plan your Saturdays around what that is. You may be a Seventh-day Adventist. Awesome. Plan your Saturdays around that is. Your church may meet in a home and it may meet on Thursday night. Awesome. Plan your Thursday evening on what that worship opportunity collectively is and corporately is. Plan your day. Make your calendar. Do your scheduling around your service corporately of God, not the other way around. I don't want my worldly schedule to dictate the time that I spend worshiping with the people of God. I want my time worshiping with the people of God to dictate the schedule that I keep in the world. And I pray everybody thinks that through and follows that through and starts making some different things. Look, I understand we got 
RVing, and I understand we got travel sports. I understand we got travel cheer. I understand we got all these things. And I'm not saying you can't do any of those things. I'm just saying find a balance where one thing is not ruling your life other than God. That's what I'm saying. Individually and collectively. Number two, worship God for who he is. Revelation 4, 6 through 8. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures. And they, covered, they, were, they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Aren't you glad that he's the God who was, who is, and who is to come? There is no point in history that God has not been. There is no point in history that God has not been the most high God. There is no point in history that there was a power that was above the God that we serve and the God that cared enough to come and serve this world with his love. So worship God for who he is. Worship God because he is the creator. But more than that, your creator and my creator. Revelation 4 verse 11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being. I tell people all the time, no matter what stage they are in life, you are valuable. You are important. You are beautiful. You are something else. Why? Because every one of us are creations of God. Every one of us. Now, some have taken an evil slant. I understand that. But it does not diminish the fact that they were created by God. There's some people I have trouble praying for. And I had to force myself to pray for them. But you know what? I'm going to do it. Because why? Their value is not in their political stance. Their value is in the fact that they are created by God too. And God loves them just as much as he loves me. And one of the things that a child of God should do is be praying for those that are not children of God. How do you know they're not children of God? Brian, are you judging them? No, I'm not judging them. I'm just simply looking at the fruit of their lives. The fruit of the life will always illustrate the master of their soul. If they're showing bad fruit, got the bad master. They're showing good fruit. They got the good master. And that's all you have to do to start walking in discernment. Just look at the fruit that is being born in someone's life. Worship God because he is the creator. Worship God because of his saving acts. In Revelation 5 verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God the Father persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. In other words, Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made extends the Father's invitation of salvation to every person that has ever been created and or procreated on the face of this earth. I was asked the question just last Monday, how can a good loving God send one, send someone to hell? And I was just very, very, very blunt with the lady that asked me that. And I said, according to the scripture, God sends no one to hell. God has extended the invitation through his son and his shed blood. For anyone that would call upon his name, they will be saved. God wills that no one is separated from him for eternity. Don't blame sinfulness and worldliness 
and materialistic thinking, don't blame that on God. God did not create that in this world. That's on us. We are the ones that perverted the perfect system that God set up to bring salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And before we got through talking, the precious lady said, are you coming back next Monday? And I said, yes, ma'am, you're on my schedule to come back next Monday with. And she said, well, would you bring me a Bible when you come? And so I thank God that she's going to be getting a brand new Bible tomorrow. And we're going to talk more and more about that Bible. Why? Because her eternity, her eternity is in the balance. Worship God because of his saving acts. Worship God because he saved you. Worship God because he's extended this salvation to all who will come on his, call upon his name. What are the means of worship? Now I want to take just a little bit of time right here. What are the means of worship? One mean of worship is music. You've just experienced a beautiful display of worshiping God through music and through vocal talents and through instrumental talents. We have sat in beautiful, wonderful, blessed, anointed, full of the unction of the Holy Spirit, worship. And I'm proud of that. Man, I love our worship pastor. I wor love our worship band. I love our worship vocalist. I pray for them. I support them. And I, if anything needs to be talked about, we communicate about that. But I just want to say it publicly. You men and women are awesome. We are blessed at the Church on Main to be led in the musical time of worship. You guys don't see what all Brother Tim Davis does through the week down here at the church. You may see a man sitting at a desk. I see a man preparing. He is always preparing. He's preparing if it's not something in the production aspect or the piano aspect or the band aspect or the vocal aspect, he's preparing. All week long, he's praying and he's preparing. And we see the outcropping of that. We see the fruit of that preparation and that prayerfulness. It comes together on Sunday mornings. But I'm going to tell you what's even more impressive about our worship pastor is what he does on Wednesday nights. It's easy to be dynamic on Sunday morning when you got an audience. It's not so easy to be dynamic on Wednesday night when there's just a little small group. But what I love about him is he does not let the number of people in the place affect the amount of anointing upon his life. Because he's going to give 100% in worship, whether it's on a Sunday morning here and going out for all to see digitally, or it's on a Wednesday night where there's just very few of us, and there's no Facebook, and there's no YouTube, and there's no live, none of that stuff. He's going to give it all. Why? Because his God gave it all for him. And he doesn't know any other way. To worship and I don't want to worship pastor that's not giving it his all or her all in worship so thank you the, but that is one mean of worship what's another one declaration this is the word telling of the greatness and the goodness of God now it all starts with the scripture everything starts with the scripture even musical worship under David what did it start with where did the book of Psalms come from they were singing hymns that was a worship book and a prayer book, a hymnal, if you will. But it's a declaration. We're declaring the word of God through the lyrics that we sing. We're declaring the word of God through the scripture that we read. We're declaring the word of God through the, through the, through the, through the, 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 pre, the sermons that we preach. We're declaring the word of God through the lives that we live. Declaration is worship. Prayer. Prayer is a mean of worship. What is prayer? Prayer is turning away from human attributes to the God who is the foundation of our human existence. In other words, we're not talking to me or talking to you. We're getting away from the human and we're going to the superhuman. We're getting away from the natural and we're stepping into the supernatural. We're not talking one to another in conversation. We are communing with Almighty God in the presence of Almighty God, in the glory of Almighty God. I don't think we understand how blessed and privileged we are that we have an open area and an open line to prayer with God, the Most High God. 
I've known some decently important people around. Not too long ago, they called me up to open up the Mississippi State Senate in prayer. And you know, everybody can oh man, you're, you're so blessed to be able to do that. And I went up there and I opened up the Mississippi State Senate in prayer and they gave me a picture and they gave me this. And I even saw somebody put something in the newspaper. I didn't even know it was going to be in the newspaper. That opened up the Mississippi State Senate in prayer. I went up there and prayed a prayer. They patted me on the back, said, oh, wonderful prayer. I went back and you know what? I don't know that any of those senators would know me my name. I bet you by the, about a week later, they wouldn't, if they'd have said Brian Stewart, they'd say, who? I bet even the senator that invited me up there, I didn't know him. I met him once I got there, but I bet even today he would say, Brian who? <laughs> and you know what? It was a wonderful invitation, and I thank God for the honor of it, and I made the best of an opportunity to sow the seeds of the gospel, but here's the bottom line. I don't have a straight line to even a Mississippi state senator, but I have got a straight line to the creator of this universe. I've got a straight line to the Savior of my soul. I can talk to the one who crawled Calvary's cross and bled and died for me. I can talk to him as much as I want to any time that I want to through the Holy Spirit. So folks, don't denigrate prayer. Prayer is worship. Brian, what should I pray? I pray. How should I pray? Pray. Pray. Man, if, 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 if pray for you eat. Don't matter if you're in a public setting or not, pray. Who's providing that meal? And you said, well, well, I went to work and made the money to buy the meal or I went to work and made the money to put the groceries in the refrigerator to prepare the meal if you're at home. Who gave you the health to go to work to do that? Who gave you the beat in your heart, the intellect in your brain, the breath in your lungs, the strength in your muscles? God did thank him don't eat a meal some people say I need to return grace you return whatever you want to return just say thank you have an attitude of gratitude and know that when you're praying you're worshiping Mitch and I were in a restaurant I forget where we were or what we were doing we were off traveling somewhere and it doesn't matter where we are we're going to hold hands and we're going to bow and we're going to pray whether it's at home or whether it's in a public setting or whether it's at the charity ball or you know whatever wherever situation we're at we're going to thank God because God is the ultimate provider for us and we were at some restaurant and it was a decently fancy restaurant and we had prayed and got ready for the ticket and when the person come up I asked the person for their ticket and they said it's already been taken care of and we were out of town we didn't know anybody else in the restaurant and I said, it's already been taken care of. They said, yeah, a couple that said to just tell y'all, bless y'all, because they just saw a young couple. They must have been some old people if they called us a young couple. <laughs> I, I do know that. That much I know. These, these folks had some age on them. But they said to tell them that we saw y'all praying and we just wanted to bless y'all for doing something in a public setting for God. Man, you never know. That's why I put up shopping carts in Walmart parking lot and pick and save. Because I'm doing, you know what I'm doing? I'm doing something that somebody else hasn't got to walk out at 100 degree temperature to do. And if I can put up two shopping carts or take somebody else's shopping cart back to the little bin so somebody don't have to get out of their car and clear a parking space that they can park in, you know what I'm doing that? I'm, I'm not doing that for any other reason than in the name of Jesus Christ. And I want to do that. And I come along the sidewalk and see a piece of paper. I want to pick it up. Why? Because I want the front of our church, I want the church to be, to be clean and presentable. Why? Because it's to the glory of God. Do all that you do to the glory of God. Live your lives to the glory of God. Whether it's in musical worship, the declaration of the word worship, whether it's through prayer, or whether it's through the symbolic acts in the church. Symbolic acts in the church are another means of worship. What do we mean by symbolic acts? We mean two things. The Lord's Supper, which we call communion, and baptism. Why do we baptize by immersion? Because immersion is the most beautiful symbolism as it illustrates what Paul taught in the New Testament. He says that we are buried with Christ and we are raised into the new life of Jesus Christ. 
completely transformed. The old has been washed away, and now behold, all things are new. I'm not saying you can't sprinkle. I'm not saying it's got to be in a river, a creek, or a lake, or a baptistry pool. I'm just telling you what the symbolism is. Just go with the symbolism that the Bible talks about, and the two ordinances, the two sacraments, if you want to call them that, if you come from a different background, because we practice the symbolism of the Bible, and we do it through the Lord's Supper and baptism. But that's not all. We do it through the way that we worship. Those are religious gestures. Those are means of worship. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a hand raiser. I, I like to raise my hands because what am I doing? I'm just, I feel like I'm holding my hands up because when I was a little boy, I would hold my hands up to people I trusted and I wanted them to pick me up and I wanted them to hold me because the closer I could get to them, the safer I felt. When I hold my hands up in worship, I'm that same little fearful boy that says, Lord, I want to be as close as you as I can get. Would you pick me up and would you hold me? And Lord, let's just spend some time together. I'm raising my hands, not because it's a tradition, thing not because it's something a worship leader told me to do I'm raising my hands because I'm a little boy wanting daddy to hold me for a while that's why I raise my hands Carmen he's gone on to be with the Lord now he raised his hand because he was taught that when you were in school and you had the right answer you raised your hand and he said I got the right answer his name is Jesus Christ so when they start talking about Jesus I can't help but throw a hand in the air amen well, I'm not telling you all you got to raise your hand. I'm just telling you why I raise my hand. I'm not going to talk about you or not talk about you. Worship him. But we do it through symbolic. Man, I'm, I, I'll, I, am, I don't, I'm, I'm white. I don't have a whole lot of rhythm. I'm at the age where my balance is, is, is funky, funky, funky. <laughs> Y'all don't know it, but sometimes in my best dance moves up here at front when I'm worshiping, I'm not dancing. I'm trying to keep from falling. I get close to this pole right here. So it catches me on that side. And the chair catches me in the back. Now, if I go that way or forward, got we got a problem. <laughs> Y'all going to say he even got slain in the spirit. But it's a worship gesture. I can't, it's just me. I can't help but move a little bit. I have got a stone bruise on my right heel. And I don't want to move. Because it hurts. But I could not help but just to jump a little bit this morning. Because I lost, you know what I lost in worship this morning? I lost the fact that my body had pain in it. I lost the fact that I had a bunch of other things on my mind when I walked into church this morning. I lost all of that. And what worship did for me this morning is it got my focus all the way on God. That's what worship did. And that's because a little boy came up to daddy and said, daddy, pick me up. And daddy scooped down out of heaven and picked me up. And our God held me for a while this morning. And that's life changing stuff. So there again, you do what gets you intimately associated with God. But don't come in and waste worship. Please don't. And that is such an aspect that I want us to grasp. Don't waste your worship opportunities. Not only do we have worship opportunities, but we got welcome gestures. We welcome people around here. I'm, I'm a hugger by nature. I don't mind hugging people. I just I will hug you. It doesn't matter if you if you if what what race or color you are. It, it doesn't matter if you're male or female. I'm just a hugger. And I've been that way pretty much all my life. I guess it's just kind of in my DNA. I'll shake your hand if you want to shake hands. I'll hug your neck if you want to hug necks. I just enjoy the welcoming gestures of a friendly face in a friendly place serving a great God. To make everybody here feel welcome. And I can promise you if I walk by you and don't speak to you and don't shake your hand or give you a high five or give you a neck hug. It's just that my mind was somewhere else and I did not do it intentionally. And all you got to do is say, hey, Brother Brian, Pastor Brian, hey, you, whatever you want to call me. And I'll turn around and we're going we're gonna to make sure we, we, we're being friendly. Because we have a welcome gestures. There's greeters at each door when you come in and when you go out for a reason. We want there to be welcome gestures. Come in and shake hands, hug necks, tell people you love them. Invite people into worship. Have your heart prepared and ready to go. And then there are, this list can continue. No doubt that this list can continue. 
There's a lot of other means of worship, but I put on there, be careful. Be careful. Because you need to be careful not to get caught up in how you worship. Because you need to be careful to make sure you're focused on who you worship. Now, I'll just be honest with you. We serve in a non-denominational church. And in a non-denominational church, you're going to have people from a lot of different backgrounds that come together. So there's going to be some traditions that are very expressive in worship. And there's going to be some traditions that are not so expressive in worship. But I can promise you one thing. Don't ever judge someone's worship by the amount of the expressive emotion in that worship. I've seen folks that was no more saved jumping and ranting and and, and worshiping God and then go out and do things that are so evil. That ain't worship, folks. That was an exhibition. That was a show. And then I've seen people that will come in and never even get out of their seat. And they are just experiencing the intimacy of the worship of the Most High God. So I'm just telling you, it's not how you worship. It's who you worship. But knowing this is what worship is. And we'll stop there for today. But in conclusion, keep the first things first. Keep it simple. Stay focused on the purpose, the true purpose of the church being the people that come together collectively blood washed with one purpose and one call upon our life and that is to glorify God not just during this hour and a half together but every day that we live I I, I dare you I challenge you I urge you to worship God until next Sunday comes And then watch how real the worship said and the preaching is next Sunday when you come to church. You want to be prepared for worship? Worship. You want to pray more and better? Pray. Why? Because we know practice makes perfect. What's wrong with worship at home? You know what I do when I get up in the morning? I turn Pandora on the TV to Christian worship radio on Pandora. And I want my life to begin to start being filled with worship. When I'm riding in the car, it's either on channel 65 on Sirius XM, which is the message, or either I'm going to plug it in or Bluetooth it to the radio, and I'm going to put Pandora on, Praise and Worship Radio. Why? Because I want to be in an atmosphere of worship. Because you know what I figured out? I can't worship God and have sinful stinking thinking at the same time. If my mind is filled with the worship of God, if I'm singing those words to here I am to worship, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Here I am to worship. Man, the last thing I'm thinking is worldly thoughts. I'm worshiping him. I'm adoring him. I'm thanking him. I'm praising him. I'm worshiping. And I'm keeping my focus, my eyes on the ball. I'm pressing forward toward the high calling in Jesus Christ. Don't let any situation or circumstance in this world or in your life right now, presently, or in your past, or that you will face in your future, steal your ability to glorify God individually, in a local church, globally, and universally. That is the purpose of the church. Not to just come together, but knowing that even when we leave, we are still just as together than when we're in this room. And we got a long way to go, but that's a really good start this morning on the purpose of the church.